Good afternoon and welcome to the Preserving Bridges Managing Assets session as part of PennDOT's first ever Virtual Innovation Week. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Danielle Klinger Grumbine with PennDOT's Bureau of Innovations and I will be your host for today's session. Following each presentation today, there will be facilitated questions and answers. If you have any questions for our speakers during today's session, please use the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen to submit your questions. We will take questions in the order in which they are received. If we do not get to all questions today, we are capturing them and we will be following up with our speakers following the event to get those questions answered and we'll provide them to participants. Throughout the Virtual Innovation Week, I also encourage you to view the more than 50 innovative tools, materials, applications, and technologies on display in our virtual exhibit hall, and that is at our event website, www.pendot.gov forward slash innovations week. These innovations are being used by federal, state, and local agencies and could help you do your job safer, better, faster, and save money. There is also a contact form on the virtual exhibit hall page that will allow you to submit any questions you have about a particular innovation. And finally, before I introduce our first speaker, please be advised that this session is being recorded. Recordings of all of our virtual innovation week sessions will be available on our event website in the next week or so. Also, if you want to listen to a playback recording of today's session, you can also click on the link that was in the calendar invitation you received for this session. When you do so, you will be able to hear a full playback recording of today's session. So our first speaker for today is Mark Nicholson. Mark is the District Bridge Engineer for PennDOT's District 1. And we'd like to welcome Mark. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right, sorry about that. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, Danielle, for the introduction. Um, we're gonna be talking today um, about Bridge Deck Link Slabs. There we go. OK, so that's the intro slide. Um, as you can see here to the on the picture on the right hand side, that's a picture of uh, the completed bridge deck link slab um, that we're going to be talking about um, uh, in this presentation. Uh, largely, the presentation is going to be um, a series of photos documenting um, the pilot project that we recent, recently completed here uh, in District 1. Um, the outline of the presentation looks like this. Uh, I'll give you a brief overview, which will better define what exactly a link slab is, uh, what it means, what it's made of, how it functions. Um, I'll talk more about the pilot project that we uh, recently finished here in District 1 talk about some of the lessons learned um, from that project. I have plenty of photos that I'll share with everybody. Give you a little bit of project cost information uh, specifically to uh, the pilot project. 
and I do have a few costs that I pulled out uh, specifically for Link Slabs. And then uh, I'll wrap things up with uh, uh, just a brief summary of what we think will be the future of Link Slabs uh, for us here in District 1. So here's a, a snapshot, um, kind of a cartoon sketch of uh, what a bridge uh, uh, link slab would look like. Essentially, uh, it's a connection between uh, two spans of a bridge. Um, typically, a lot of our older bridges that were built in the interstate era and even into the uh, more recent years, you had two independent uh, uh, bridge deck uh, spans that were joined by some sort of a connection. A lot of times it was a joint seal, which would just be a sealant material uh, that filled in the space between two independent simple span uh, decks, which over time uh, with the expansion and contraction of uh, bridges uh, and those decks, those uh, seal materials would eventually start to leak and allow uh, the salt water from de-icing operations to enter in and come in contact with uh, the bridge components. The way the link, link slab works is it provides a watertight connection uh, spanning over that joint uh, and basically eliminates that uh, a possibility for any water to leak through and come in contact with the underlying bridge components. It's basically um, the primary components of a link slab is a, a material known as an ultra high performance concrete, which we'll talk a little bit more about later in the presentation. There's also some reinforcing steel uh, fibers and some pozzolan materials that's added into the UHPC as well. But the idea here is you're, is you're making a, um, in, our, in the case of our bridge, it was about a four or four and a half inch uh, UHPC slab that tied the two decks together. And we'll talk about uh, more of that here in a minute. Here's a photo of why. Um, we would be taking an interest in bridge deck link slabs. Um, this is a bridge here in District 1 um, that has an original uh, type of joint construction. Uh, if you look at the photo on the top, you can see the black uh, sealant material that I tried to describe previously. Um, that's obviously failed. You see the salt laden water uh, has come in contact with the beams. Uh, the pier caps, and you can see what happens when that when that occurs. Um, so bridge engineers across the Commonwealth and across the country uh, have been facing uh, with this uh, this type of uh, maintenance and, and joint failure material um, for many, many years. And the link slab uh, is one of the solutions that we're looking at to prevent this from happening. Here's a photograph of our pilot project, and I'm going to spend the next uh, several slides talking about um, this bridge and how this project went for us here in District 1. Um, this bridge is located in Mercer County. It's on State Route 1009. Uh, it spans over uh, Lake Wilhelm. Uh, it's a three span bridge built in the late 60s. Um, the total length of the bridge was just over 180 feet, as you can tell in the photo. Um, it's three spans uh, over water. Um, there's some BMS information and ECMS information there. If any of you are business partners and have access to those systems, you feel free to, to look up some more information on your own. Um, but the scope of the work was uh, generally a, a typical rehabilitation um, for this bridge. Um, we had planned on doing a, a scarification to the existing bridge deck uh, and then applying a, a latex modified concrete overlay. Uh, we had to do some minor substructure repairs to it, but primarily the main thing we were trying to accomplish here was to implement the UHPC and eliminate the, the joints that were located over the pier. So um, what the photo is showing you here on the left is uh, we actually had to remove an existing asphalt overlay uh, from the bridge. Um, as I said before, the, the plan was to scarify and hydro demo uh, the existing uh, deck surface to remove any unsound concrete 
Uh, once that was accomplished, we had applied the, the LMC overlay, and that's what you're looking at in this photo here was after that uh, asphalt had been removed, uh, the scarification hydro demo, and then the, the finished latex has been uh, placed. And that's actually a distant photograph of them uh, just beginning the removal necessary to, to build a link slab. Here's a close up picture of what uh, the removal looks like. Um, essentially what you're doing is removing about a, a foot to a foot and a half on either side of the joint. Um, you're only removing down about four to four and a half inches in this case, but that also involves removing the parapet as well. Um, the longitudinal rebar was saved um, and incorporated into the new um, link slab. Uh, a backer rod material had to be installed um, down in between the two slabs and the old joint to prevent anything from uh, leaching down through. Uh, a grout material was also placed there as well uh, to provide a, a smooth surface to pour um, the link slab material on. It also uh, acts as a debonding zone, which we'll, I'll show you more about that in a future slide. This is a, a photograph of what that uh, link slab looked like once the demolition was complete. Um, the black material that you see uh, in the photo is actually a, a gasket material that is placed down uh, on, directly on top of that mortar bed. And that is a, a deep bonding zone that prevents the UHPC from bonding from that, um, that joint, that existing uh, backer rod and joint material and essentially what we're trying to do is allow that UHPC uh, to bend and flex a little bit as uh, the live loads cross over the bridge and also provide some thermal expansion as well. And uh, that rebar it was only a single layer of steel that's uh, provided uh, within the link slab, and as you can see, it was just tied to the existing longitudinal deck bars that were saved. So the day of the pour, we actually uh, placed the, the UHPC uh, early in September. I think it was on September 10th. Uh, the contractor, um, uh, the supplier of the UHPC, UHPC actually mixes material on site for those of you that aren't familiar with it uh, they don't batch it at a, a concrete plant and deliver it in truck it's actually a bag mix that's uh, done right there on site here's a photograph um, they actually had two mixers uh, brought in uh, brought in on a, uh, a trailer system uh, you can see the bag mixes uh, or the bags of the mix stacked uh, on the trailer behind them um, so the supplier basically provided the labor to do all the mixing and the batching there on site. Here's a photograph of the actual placement. Um, the interesting thing about the UHPC is it's uh, a fairly flowable material, but it has uh, kind of a sticky uh, nature to it as well. Um, as you can see there, they actually have to use a shovel to scrape the material out of um, the uh, the wheelbarrow, um, but if you look uh, in the joint itself, uh, the material is actually flowing out. So the slump on this uh, was fairly high. It was about an eight or a nine inch slump. And um, so it is fairly flowable, but yet at the same time, it needs some help trying to get out of the, the wheelbarrow. Um, the other interesting thing about the, the link slab is you want to finish the uh, uh, UHPC slightly higher than the adjoining uh, deck. So if you look in the photos, uh, you'll see a strip of plywood. It's about a quarter inch thick uh, plywood immediately adjacent to the joint. And then the form is actually placed on top of that. What we're trying to do there is to finish the UHPC uh, slightly higher than the existing joint or the existing uh, bridge decks. And then what we do is we come in and uh, actually grind off uh, the top quarter inch to that UHPC so that it's flush with the adjoining deck. This is a photograph of the uh, the finished um, formwork after the, the UHPC had been placed. 
Um, we actually had to use chimneys to provide kind of a pressure hit, if you would, where they were pouring the UHPC down through those uh, buckets that they had cut holes in the bottom of to actually force the UHPC to flow um, through uh, the form and to get up to that quarter inch higher than the adjoining deck elevation. What you're looking at here is the following day um, after the placement of the UHPC. Um, as you can see, uh, there is a lip there where we were successful in, in getting that uh, quarter inch reveal of the UHPC higher than the adjoining deck elevation. Um, and then the next photograph, this is what the finished UHPC joint looks like after the diamond grinding has been completed. Um, the diamond grinding um, is, is kind of a tricky operation. Um, it takes, it's kind of an art to make sure that you're not going down into the, the bridge deck, the adjoining bridge deck, um, but the contractor actually did a pretty good job on this and making sure that, that, that we weren't removing any material, that latex material off the adjoining deck. Here's a close up photos of the completed uh, link slab. The photograph on the left, um, I tried to hold the camera as close as I could, um, but still, you know, get a enough a big picture look of what's going on there. On the right, you see that uh, darker gray color. That's actually the, the latex um, overlay of the adjoining deck. And then to the left, the lighter material is actually the UHPC. Um, as you can see, there's a pretty tight joint between the two. We didn't really get a, a crack or an opening per se, it seemed like it sealed and uh, pretty well and joined to the, uh, the, the latex. On the right hand side is a photograph uh, largely of the parapet. Um, now the parapet was filled in with our standard PennDOT uh, AA concrete. Um, you don't have to use the, the UHPC um, to fill that in, but um, that has to be removed and filled in as part of the UHPC construction. Talk briefly a little bit about the lessons learned um, with the, uh, the the pilot project. Um, we we like I said we placed the the UHPC joint. I want to say it was uh, September 10th, and for about the uh, the the week to two weeks following, I took several uh, trips out there to kind of monitor, as along with our inspection staff to kind of monitor the performance of the UHPC. And based on what we saw, um, there wasn't any signs of any cracks or separation in the joints. Um, you know, it's pulling away from the adjoining um, the decks or any type of hairline cracks uh, were witnessed uh, in the UHPC. Um, so that's a good thing. That was a, a little bit of a concern from us. I guess the skepticism on, on our side of things was you know, exactly how was this UHPC going to set, set up? Um, we opened the bridge to traffic. We allowed traffic to run on it for uh, 28 days uh, before we put the uh, waterproof membrane and bituminous overlay back on top of the bridge. We wanted to, to leave the bridge open and not cover it or uh, exposed and not overlay it, but there was already several, like five or six inches of bituminous overlay on the bridge. And for us to adjust the profile to accomplish that was going to add additional cost to the project. So the best we could do was to have a 28 day period to monitor the link slab before we paved over them to see how they uh, reacted to live load traffic and some of the freeze or the uh, thermal expansion that we had, which we did have some pretty good temperature swings. Uh, we had a few nights that got down into the 30s and we're back up into the 70s the following day. So we were pretty pleased to see that the Lynx lab held up well. There was no signs of cracking that we could see prior to placement over the overlay. Um, one of the things that we do want to talk about here briefly, though, uh, one of the problems that we ran into um, is we the supplier actually provided a an accelerated mix. Um, for the uh, UHPC and during placement we had two mixers and one of those mixers uh, went down on us um, for maybe about a half an hour an hour 
and that slowed obviously slowed down production production of being able to to get the UHPC in the joint. And what we ran into is a little bit of setup uh, started to happen, and it was because of the accelerated mix. Uh, the supplier told me that um, you, they sometimes see setup as early as about an hour uh, from time of batching before they start to see an initial setup. And that was in that time uh, that one of the mixers went went down. As you can see in the middle, right at the very crown, we had to place a little bit of um, uh, material just to fill in a little bit of a low spot um, that was caused by some setup, and we just weren't able to get the UHPC in uh, all the way up to the you know the crown there in the center of the bridge. Um, it was a very minor. Um, it wasn't like it was you know, halfway down into the joint that we didn't get filled up. It was just a very minor amount. So we agreed to have the contractor place a, an epoxy base uh, grout just to fill that in before it was paved. But um, that was really the only issue that we uh, had during placement. Um, we were also a little worried about being over water. It, would there be any um, uh, possibility of any of the UHPC leak, leaking through the forms, but we were actually um, pretty uh, happy that we didn't have any leakage. Um, summary of the costs, uh, the total project was about a little over 700,000. Um, um, that was for paving, guide rail bridge work, everything. Um, UHPC, the actual cost uh, from the contract was anywhere from $730 to $790 per linear foot, which is what was bid. As a comparison, we might see a strip seal um, bid price around $400 a linear foot. So uh, we do see some, or we did see some higher costs, but that was to be expected since it was new to our contractors. But we feel pretty optimistic that if we uh, continue to use this, the the uh, link slabs, we'll see more competitive prices. Uh, we're already working on another bridge here in District One. Uh, it's SR2102 over I-79. Here's a picture of that bridge. Uh, there's actually two bridges uh, separated by an earth mound and a median. Uh, we're scheduled for a 20, uh, 2021 letting. Uh, in the spring and construction should occur uh, next summer. Um, this bridge is not currently overlaid, so this will be a good candidate for us to allow that uh, link slab to be uh, exposed uh, without an overlay. We should be able to have some long-term monitoring of, of its performance. Just one uh, technical note I wanted to share with everybody. FHWA does have a design and construction uh, guideline for Fieldcast UHBC connections. If you wanted to take a Google snapshot of that and Google it, you could. Uh, they provide some good case studies and some guidance out there that um, uh, I did take a look at as we were preparing the plans for. And I'll pause there um, before we move on to the next presentation about flex beams. Uh, Danielle, are you there? Is there any questions? Yes, I do believe we have one question. I'll, I'll turn it over to Crystal Ann. Yes, we do have a question in. Were there any adjustments made to the bearings or fixidity conditions? That's a good question and no, there was no adjustments to it. Um, the one pier was a fixed fixed arrangement. Uh, the other one was uh, fixed in expansion, I believe. And um, with the shorter spans uh, of the bridge, we felt pretty confident that even though, you know, you're, you're kind of locking uh, the the the, uh, the the spans together with the the uh, UHPC, but the UHPC is designed to flex. It's more durable and actually allows some movement to occur with there uh, within it. Um, there may be some very very microscopic kind of micro cracking that occurs but that's by design in the UHPC. So we felt pretty confident that just leaving the, the bearing fixity alone, um, you know, it should work for us. And like I said, from what we had seen, it, it, there was no problems visually seen during the 28 day monitoring. Okay, we did have another question, but I believe due to time, we're gonna have to keep moving on. So we'll have to uh, flag that one for follow-up. Um, because the 20 minutes has passed 
so we need to keep moving on. Yes, Mark, it, you, if you have about five minutes to review over bridge flex beams. This one's going to go a lot shorter. Um, that won't be a problem because uh, largely with the bridge flex beams, um, we do have a, a contract in place right now. We let a contract uh, earlier this summer, but construction hasn't begun. So I'm going to largely just go over a brief overview of what the flex beam is. Um, can't get the. There we go. Um, so real quickly, just give you a flex beam overview status of the project uh, that we're working on here. So event, uh, essentially a flex beam is a uh, precast uh, bridge module that's composed of um, steel stringers um, that have been cut in half uh, with a shop um, uh, built pre, uh, reinforced concrete deck that's integrated right into those uh, I beams. There's a, a photo or a drawing on the left. Um, I got some more photos here that'll better explain it. So you can see here on the right, that's the actual I beams that have been cut. There's been holes drilled through them that allow the rebar to place right through them. On the left, you can see what the rebar cage looks like, uh, timber forms, and this was all done in the, uh, the fab shop uh, of an experimental uh, module that was uh, done for us. Um, this is the pilot project here in uh, District 1 that were uh, the contract that we just let. There's the information there, ECMS 97126. It was let in June, uh, but construction is not to occur until 21. It's a fairly short bridge. It's a 32 foot span, uh, 23 foot curb to curb. Uh, that's a typical section showing uh, what the, the flex beam section looks like. Um, basically, these panels are fabricated in the shop and then a closure pour is done in the field again with a UHPC. And then on this particular bridge, we're going to apply a membrane waterproofing and a bituminous overlay. Uh, this is the UHPC, which I already talked about, um, but we do have a standard special provision um, in our PennDOT ECMS library. Uh, very fine aggregates. You're not going to see 57 stone in this stuff. It's, it's more like uh, powder and sand. And again, like I mentioned during the, the link slab discussion, it's uh, a very ductile and offers some bending, and it's also a very uh, low permeable uh, material. Uh, the key thing I wanted to share today was on the left, this is from the uh, fabricator that's actually building the, the flex beams. Uh, they sent us some 3D CAD drawings, uh, and we had some discussions as we were going through the shop drawing approval process, and um, we they shared these drawings with us just to show us how the rebar cage was was going to look like. Um, as an example, on the left hand side, uh, this was the 3D model that they that they provided, and then on the right hand side is the actual engineering drawing that was included in the structure plan. So you can kind of see how they were able to take our drawing and actually generate a 3D view of it. Um, really all we had to do is make some very minor spacing adjustments to some of the rebar just to ensure there wasn't any interference from enjoy, uh, the adjoining uh, flex beam modules when they were placed in the field. Uh, real quickly, uh, that contract uh, for that bridge was at 593,000. The superstructure costs for the, uh, um, the flex beam was 365,000, so a little over half, maybe two thirds of that cost was actually superstructure. Um, that equates to about $670 per square foot, um, which, and that's all inclusive, and that's a little higher than what we normally see for a structure uh, of this type. Um, but the next steps for us is, uh, we're obviously gonna be monitoring the fabrication and, and construction. Uh, like we did with the link slab, we'll be tracking any issues and develop lessons learned, and uh, we'll be applying all of that into uh, PennDOT design standards. And we may be at, uh, placing strain gauges in the future to uh, just get some strain data uh, to help us with some better understanding of the loading and how the flex beam 
uh, reacts to live load live loads. So that's all I had. I'm trying to keep that short and sweet. Any questions? Thank you, Mark. We do have two questions here that we hopefully have time for. So back for the one um, related to the link slab. Was diamond grinding necessary if an overlay was going to occur? Um, the reason that we chose to do it was to ensure that we had as flush of a surface as possible. We were afraid that if you had a little bit of a lip there, it may threaten the integrity of your of your membrane, your waterproof membrane. So our personal preference was to diamond grind it smooth so that we had the best um, chance of the waterproof membrane being intact. Um, I guess that would, you know, if you wanted to pursue doing that without grinding, that may require some discussion with the suppliers and fabricators to see what their thoughts are on it. But we chose to do it to give us the smoothest surface as possible, not to threaten the waterproof membrane. Thank you. Another question, will new bridge construction start using link slabs instead of expansion dams? Uh, that's a good question. I think with uh, new Brit with new uh, construction, um, I think I have seen some details where uh, you can do some sort of a, a link slab, but really in Pennsylvania, we've been um, our new bridge decks are uh, being built with uh, live load continuity diaphragms. So in doing that, I think we can, you know, eliminate open joints across most of our bridges and where you do need expansion dams it's probably because there's enough movement that that's really your only option that you have to go with thank you mark thank you mark again if there are other questions that you have regarding mark's presentation feel free to enter them into the chat box on the right hand side of your screen um, if time permits, at the end of this uh, session, we will go back to any questions that we have not yet gotten to. So our next speakers today are Dr. Sugata Roy, who is the Associate Research Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and Dr. John Braley, who is a Research Associate, both with Rutgers University. I'd like to welcome Dr. Roy and Dr. Braley. Thanks, Daniel. Um, do we have the control now? Yes, you do. Oh, OK, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Daniel and others, uh, for the opportunity to present uh, at this uh, Innovation Week, Virtual Innovation Week uh, uh, for, for PennDOT. Uh, both my uh, co-presenter, Dr. John Braley, and I, we are residents of Pennsylvania, so we feel very proud to be part of this as well. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, a very unique structural testing facility at, at Rutgers, which has come online uh, about uh, four or five years back in 2015 to be precise, and we're going to explain that. We also recognize uh, our other co-presenters or co-authors actually, they're not presenting with us, uh, Professor Franklin Moon, uh, Professor Nenad Gusunski, and Professor Ji Gong. So with that, I will uh, move on. So I will present a couple of slides and then I will pass on to Dr. Braley. Dr. Braley is the key person who is uh, keeping this test facility running and he is much more knowledgeable than I am. So if you have any tough questions that goes for him, all the credit goes to me. OK, so with that, uh, let me see if I can turn the slides. Uh, Daniel, could you uh, pro progress the slides for us, please? I think somehow not being able to do that yet because oh, now you have it. OK, thank you. So uh, this is a picture of the beast facility. Um, uh, as you see here, it's what it is, is a massive uh, environmental chamber for structural testing. The acronym, the beast is an acronym for bridge evaluation and structural testing. Uh, facility. So what you see on the on the picture here is the is a massive spine beam and there is a live load that gets reacted against that spine beam and tests the uh, bridge deck which is underneath hidden. Uh, what we see here that uh, 
that silver colored uh, trust kind of setup that is a that is the environmental chamber cover which we can move at open the chamber and put in structures and close them up and so on and so forth uh, just to show you a little bit about um, okay so this is the inside of the setup what you see there is a hanging uh, tandem axle <laughs> which is not really hanging it is actually hanging from the spine beam and that is the cover of the environmental chamber what happens is we when once we lower once we put the deck on and lower the system this uh, these wheels will be running across the deck and that's how we can create passage of wheels across the structure now the setup itself um, can be cooled down uh, under enclosed set situation from up to zero degree centigrade uh, up to zero degree fahrenheit and then can be heated up to 100 degree fahrenheit that it takes about 24 hours to do that we can apply uh, salt uh, or brine solution on the deck to accelerate corrosion we can control uh, different uh, environmental conditions and also we can test different kind of uh, uh, structural overlay uh, structural setup uh, superstructure like steel <coughs> or concrete and all different kinds of uh, bridge deck component that we can test in an accelerated condition. So just to talk a little bit about the capability of this laboratory. It's a very unique laboratory because uh, this was uh, not uh, this kind of uh, very unique in this country. Not you do not have this kind of facility anywhere. It was established to, uh, to check the long term performance of bare reinforced concrete bridge decks, common bridge joints, various steel coatings as well as steel decks also for example we can test orthotropic steel decks also in this setup so we can do fatigue testing as well as simultaneous environmental testing on that um, we established the long-term performance of uh, various common overlay systems uh, we also want to determine the, and quantify the ability of various non-destructive evaluation techniques like gpr and uh, half cell potentiometer and all that all different kind of techniques that are available for non-destructively evaluating concrete bridge, bridge decks uh, are kind of uh, part of this deal. We could also test, and right now there are some tests going on, and John is going to talk about that a little more, where we are testing different kind of coatings on steels, like galvanizing, metallizing, and three port pen system, that is the conventional pen system on steel structures. So that is the primary uh, capability of this setup. Uh, the, the specimen right now there is a project going on at this time the specimen construction kind of began uh, between middle of may last year and it was finished in july and then we started some accelerated testing and some data collection we are going in different uh, time period and scale uh, of 30 days 45 days and 90 days uh, to create databases and see how the deterioration is progressing uh, we have done so for 70 days of active loading over the last year because of COVID uh, shutdown and all that. We have been, of course, delayed like everybody else in this country, but um, we are making progress. Right now, we are again continuing testing. Uh, 800,000 passes of 60 keep of tandem rolling load has been done. Uh, so the capacity of this rolling setup is about 60 keep. Uh, we have done 40 freeze thaw cycles and we have provide put on the deck about 2600 gallons of six percent brine solution so with that i will pass it on to dr braley to take it further and give you some more details thank you sagata so as sagata mentioned that first specimen was the construction finished summer of last year we gave it 30 days for the deck to cure um, before we commenced any testing the specimen itself was designed using the seventh edition of the Ashto LRFD design, bridge design specs. It's composed of four rolled steel girders. Each has a different metallized coating. Uh, so that's as a hot dip galvanized, 100% aluminum, inorganic zinc, and then an 8515 zinc aluminum blend. It has an eight inch thick cast in place deck with number five black bar uh, reinforcing. Uh, and then two of the bays we use stay in place forms and then one other we uh, we use removable forms just to compare the performance. We also installed a full fixed instrumentation system. So we that included 40 strain gauges that were embedded in the deck. Uh, each strain gauge also included a temperature gauge if they're mister. And those gauges were tied alongside the longitudinal and transverse rebar 
uh, and at different depths to provide uh, a full characterization of the strain profile in any given section. The steel girders also had strain gauges, uh, again, to, to better characterize the cross-sectional strain profile, also to locate neutral axes. Um, and then we had a strain gauge rosettes at the ends of two of the girders to better characterize shear strain. Uh, strain gauges as well on the pedestals to capture the entire load presented to the structure. And then displacement gauges and acceleration gauges distributed at quarter points to really give a full picture of the def of the shape of deformation and motion uh, of the structure under loading. So in total, there's I think 120 different sensors. Um, when the construction was finished, actually several months after, we realized there was a significant error uh, during construction, and it, it turned out to be a result of the Bidwell machine that was used to pour the deck. So the, the Bidwell machine ran along rails that were mounted to the exterior girders. Uh, due to the configuration of that structure, uh, the weight of the Bidwell machine actually caused those exterior girders to rotate, and the bolts on the diaphragms were left loose, so further uh, allowing rotation of those exterior girders. In the process, the rails actually deflected downwards as a result of that rotation, and we ended up having about three quarter inch less cover in the mid-span region. So instead of two inches of cover, we only got an inch and a, inch and a quarter in that mid-span region. At first, we were, we were kind of dismayed about this outcome, but I think now we're looking forward to seeing the effect of a reduced cover on the long-term performance of a, of a bridge deck. Here we have a video of the carriage actually traveling back and forth. So normally during operation, we have it running 12, 13 miles per hour. Uh, it goes back and forth like this. So this was back in October um, of 2000 of last year. Uh, we've now had just about 900,000 passes over this season. Uh, that's five different load passes. And in between about every 200, 880 to 200,000 passes, we'll pause loading and will perform non-destructive evaluation of the bridge deck. So that's electrical resistivity, half-cell potential, impact echo, USW, um, as well as photographs and infrared images to really capture the, the current condition of the bridge deck at each of those, those time steps. So that's where we're at so far. Uh, unfortunately, our sponsor doesn't want us to release some of the data just as yet, but uh, we're starting to see deterioration. The laminations are starting to form. Um, and in the next couple of months, once the deck condition re reaches a certain level, we're going to end phase one and install overlays. Actually, two overlays will be installed of two different types so we can compare them side by side. Uh, it's likely going to be a UHPC on one side and an asphalt with a membrane on the other. And then once that's installed, we'll pick up testing again for probably another six to 12 months, um, depending on how deterioration again progresses. But after that, uh, we're, we're looking forward to what we can use this facility for in the future. So if anybody has any ideas of, of what they want to see tested in, in a controlled environment, um, we're looking forward to all the different things that we can do with this. So if you have any ideas, please feel free to reach out. I think my colleague also wanted to say a few words about the pooled fund study. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Roy. So uh, one of the things I did not mention before was this whole facility was funded by, uh, was uh, built from a funding by in New Jersey DOT. And New Jersey DOT since have uh, generated a transportation pool fund program uh, in which uh, they would like to investigate different kind of bridge deck or the bridge structure condition and accelerated uh, environmental degradation uh, and try to take that information for modeling purposes and so on. This pool fund study is now posted and New Jersey DOT has already committed $350,000. And I know PennDOT has expressed interest to join this uh, study. That's very encouraging. And then there are other states also who have expressed interest. Uh, to join this. So this is something good. Our current project is being funded by somebody else. Uh, we don't mention the sponsor because sponsor was not very really happy to share all this information yet. Uh, but uh, once this project is over, we are looking forward to start the pool fund program. And in the pool fund program, you should be able to join. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming some other states are also in the call today or on the on the virtual webinar today, and they, they can also join. 
and try to bring in whatever or try to investigate whatever they want to look at uh, anything that's their interest something that could be futuristic some new uh, uh, overlay or uh, joint protections or uh, corrosion protection measures or something that is existing in the current infrastructure asset that they want to look at and model their deterioration and estimate uh, some kind of intervention measures uh, and do asset management effectively. So there are a lot of opportunities with this. We are very excited and if not anything, we can do real time uh, fatigue, load, fatigue testing of uh, structures. It's not only a unique location. It can be testing the whole structure and simultaneously generates lot many data points and so on. So with that, uh, we end our presentation. Thank you all again for giving us the opportunity and we look forward to any questions that you may have. Yes, we will wait a minute or two so here to see if any questions come in through the uh, Q&A chat feature. In the meantime, what are some of the challenges you're facing conducting these tests? Yeah, I can answer that. Uh, so because this is the first long term testing run of this facility, uh, there's been a lot of working out the kinks. Uh, it's it's a big facility, high loads run back and forth continuously, a lot of vibration and shaking. And although we're trying to accelerate the deterioration of the specimen, a lot of times we, we end up deterioration of this, deteriorating the facility as well. Um, so it's been kind of constant finding things going wrong, fixing them, um, kind of making it stronger in the process but any kind of repair involves climbing around with chains and winches to try to move stuff around. So it, it, it's definitely aptly named the beast because there's definitely challenging days working on it and keeping it running. I'm sure. Thank you. I haven't seen any questions come through, um, but I know I was kind of curious, you know, how, are you feeling it is effective? um simulating real life demands well it's I, th I think it's definitely effective at at applying loads that are consistent with real world demands i, I think to be clear is it's very different i mean we're cycling temperatures a lot faster than most areas will will see um the constant loading is a lot more than most bridges would see in the it's just a single carriage not an actual vehicle but i, I think the important thing is that this facility was designed to impose the conditions that are going to most deteriorate a bridge. Um, so we're, we're definitely successful in that is because we are producing deterioration. Um, and I, I think it's important that the magnitudes are all similar or consistent with real world loads. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely different. Thank you. We do have a question here. Any advantages of your facility over the one at FHWA Structures Lab in the basement? Well, uh, FHWA Structures Lab is a different setup than this one. Uh, FHWA Structures Lab is like any other traditional structures lab where they have actuators, uh, strong floor, and then you can put in a deck and uh, load them under actuators to uh, at localized different location and kind of test. But it is not an environmental testing facility. It is more of a, a, a normal room temperature structural testing facility. What we are doing here is we are kind of simulating the environment as well. So we are creating uh, freeze thaw cycles. We are adding salt to the deck. We are testing the structure as the environment by simulating the environmental changes and so on. Um, we can also modify the loading on the uh, uh, on the tires or the, on, on the tandem. It can go up to maximum 60 kip, but we can bring it down below by changing some pressure inside uh, the, the, the arrangement. So there are some variabilities and advantages of that. The major advantage is that we are deteriorating or testing the entire deck at, at every time, right? So when we do kind of discrete loading of actuators, those are good for certain purposes, but they only test a particular location of the structure per se, where the, where the load is or local location to it. But here it is, you are testing the entire deck under the load and it, it simulates very, it is very interesting. We have seen behavior that you see on the real deck. For example, along the wheel path, you will 
safety, the salts get kind of splashed out of the wheel path and they kind of get pulled on the side on the uh, on the on the shoulders or non traversed path of the uh, of the deck. And the corrosion happens on those areas, not so much under the track itself. And that's what we are seeing also. We are seeing hairline cracks happening on the deck, right? What you will see in the real structure. So this is very important and it, it generates a lot of useful information for deterioration modeling. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very unique setup. It's not really what Federal Highway has or any other lab for that matter. There are many other labs in this country now that can do large scale testing and uh, it's not like them, it's different. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question here uh, related to, you know, the black rebar being used instead of epoxy coated. You know, can you expand on why that is and if it has to do with, you know, the deck being exposed, you know, to salts and things in the fall uh, with icing, you know, as we have here in, in Pennsylvania, especially the northern part of Pennsylvania, kind of talking about uh, the, the black rebar instead of epoxy coated? So the main reason for Black Rebar was the current sponsor wanted to look at bridge deck somewhere around uh, built in the mid 80s. OK, before epoxy bar was a common uh, practice. It's a class A concrete and a rebar of that time. So they tried to represent the structures that are in service currently, say 40, 50 years in that time frame. So uh, mostly the focus was to look at the current existing asset and create a asset management plan based on that test data and modeling that we get or the data that we get and then we get the deterioration modeling out of it. But epoxy coated bar is a is an opportunity and I am expecting uh, we all are expecting that when the NJDOT pool fund study happens and different states join in, uh, then there will be interest in looking at all different kind of rebars different states are using. Uh, based on their requirement. For example, PennDOT, PennDOT has uh, committed for that study. I know for sure and I'm pretty sure PennDOT will be interested in looking at uh, epoxy coated rebars. So in the next uh, set of testing, what will happen is we can then incorporate all these different testing conditions or all these different testing requirements or interests that different people have or who are contributing to that and come up with different test results. That's the, that's the good part about this is we don't have to wait 50 years to see the results. We can see it in probably a year, year and a half. Thank you very much. That's all the questions. Appreciate so your thank time. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. Yes, thank you, Dr. Roy and Dr. Braley. We appreciate you joining us today. Um, again, if you do have questions for Dr. Roy and Dr. Braley, feel free to enter them into the chat box on the right hand of your screen, and um, we will look to get to them at the end of toward the end of today's session. So with that, I'm going to introduce our next two speakers. Um, we have Keith Cornelius, who is the Assistant District Bridge Engineer in PennDOT's District 11, and Stephen Shanley, who is the Director of Public Works for Allegheny County. Um, we have a few slides from Keith, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Steve. So I will uh, pass the baton to you, Keith. Thanks, Danielle. Appreciate it. Um, just quickly before uh, Mr. Shanley gets into uh, Allegheny County, um and and the work they're doing there um we just wanted to touch real quick on the the local bridge inspection contracts that we we administer out of uh district 11. um as you can see there there's currently five they're kind of split up uh, geographically uh, by our, our local owners um they're kind of on a four to five year cycle um and they're available for all our local owners to uh kind of take advantage of um to to get their bridge inspections done um you know the big advantages to these uh for our local owners is um you know the, the whole agreement is kind of administered through our district, meaning, you know, we take care of um, advertising, selecting, um, and, you know, everything that has to do with, with the contract itself. Um, any of the reports that come in are, are viewed by my staff, so you know that everything is going to be in compliance with uh, FHWA and PennDOT standards before it even gets to the locals. Um, the, uh, the cost share, the 20% cost share for the locals is actually taken out of their liquid fuels uh, uh, allotment too. So uh, no reimbursement agreements are necessary uh, when they kind of go through us for that. Um, and it also makes our consultant and uh, my staff at the district available to uh, put together uh, and, and help the, the locals put together any plan of actions or, or come up with mitigation strategies for some of the priority repairs that, uh, that come up during this, uh, the, the inspections. 
So this is just a quick uh, rundown of the process. Obviously, uh, the consultants perform the inspection. They submit the report to us. Uh, we go through it, make sure that everything uh, is addressed as far as uh, you know, PennDOT and FHWA standards. Uh, that gets passed on to the local owner. And um, you know, a, a lot of times we find too that um, you know some of our locals don't have the staffing that that Allegheny County has uh, and are able to interpret the reports or, or know what they're supposed to do. So that's why we make our consultants and ourselves available. To kind of help them out uh, through all those things and make sure that they understand what priority repairs you know need to be done right now or, or some, some that can wait so um and the last thing is uh you know the coordination with the local owner kind of entails you know the, letting them know whether their local crews can maybe take care of it or if a contractor is needed for it or for something they actually have to to go through and and program an actual project to to take care of those issues so um the final thing, obviously, is when the repairs are completed, um, you know, we we make sure that the, they address the priority repair and then and that's removed from from our database and then we move forward. So, um, again, these are these are great, uh, great agreements for the for our locals to take care of. And um, it, it really helps out keeping everybody in compliance and, and allows us to uh, kind of maintain that relationship with all of our locals as well. So. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to uh, Mr. Steve Shanley who can kind of talk about, you know, the, the what they do once they receive this kind of information from our consultants and, and from us uh, moving forward. So, Steve. Thank you, Keith uh, and Danielle. Thank you for having Allegheny County present here. Uh, we have the we encompass the city in uh, 130 municipalities. Uh, we appreciate all the work that we do with District 11. They're a great partner uh, with uh, having to contract and inspect our NBIS structures. Uh, we also have a contract we put out for our under 20 foot structures. So we do put a contract out for those and we hire a consulting firm to do those. So that's another option. I'm going to go through some of the processes we have uh, to address some of the issues that come up as part of uh, our inspection reports. Uh, this might be more helpful for local authorities and uh, I can help anybody out after this presentation if I uh, need any other uh, direction or assistance. Uh, PennDOT is using a lot of these. Uh, we mirror what they do, so we appreciate all their help. First of all, uh, when we get our inspection reports and we go through them and if we do, uh, like Keith had said, we have zeros or ones. We want to address them in a timely manner. Uh, any type of flooding or storm damage, uh, landslide or vehicular trap crashes or barges that hit in the piers in the river. Uh, some of those ones are zero ones. Uh, we do have contracts that we can address those issues right away. We have a design contract. That we can get a structural engineer out there on the site uh, promptly, and then we have uh, a repair contract where we have a contractor that we can pull out to the site. Okay, some of these uh, other examples uh, we had uh, were uh, structure deteriorate and we lost a lane on the road, so we had to get out there with emergency contract and uh, uh, repair the end of the culvert. Uh, we got that done in a timely manner and got the lane open. Also, there's sky repairs that come up uh, as part of inspection, some undermining on abutments uh, where we might lose an old abutment on an old structure. Uh, we can get out there timely and get that underpinned. It's another structure where we had a weight limit on it and an uh, inspection report uh, indicated that we were going to have to lower the rating. So uh, we were able to jump on this with our emergency contracts with our consultant and contractor and get this structure uh, replaced, at least the roof of it and uh, pro slab. So uh, it's a great opportunity to jump on these issues promptly and uh, get these issues taken care of. Another issue uh, you can take care of is with preservation. To extend the life of the structures, uh, preservation is a great option. Uh, cost effective repairs and uh, you can push rehabs down the road. So you address some of it with preservation uh, before you get too far down with too many uh, structural issues. So uh, this is a great option and we work with District 11 on all these projects. Uh, they help us and guide us through uh, making sure we have uh, great set of plans, so uh, they're a great partner in getting this work done. We use federal funding for these. 
This is one of the bridges down downtown Pittsburgh, uh, the 16th Street Bridge. So we uh, we perform deck repairs, downspot and scuppers. Uh, we also with the IBAR connections, uh, we work with the spec from District uh, 11 uh, for uh, sandblasting. Actually, they do a water blast and we did a sandblast because you get a lot of rust packing in some of these older bridges. So that alleviates a lot of the problem. We can get a good paint job in between there, uh, like six, seven, and eight bring. We got uh, a lot of eye bars packed together. This is Fleming Park Bridge. Uh, we did a latex overlay. Uh, we're painting on this. So some of the work you do preservation to preserve them before you have to replace the entire deck. So it's been great uh, for the county to use this because uh, it pushes the rehabs further down the road. So uh, a great tool to have in a toolbox. Another one, Homestead, we have a grid deck on here. We had to replace the membrane uh, expansion dams. So uh, another way to preserve these structures and uh, hold off on any rehabs, which are very expensive. And we uh, also put together group jobs, uh, state and federal contracts, uh, different opportunities. Uh, the picture there is a 10th Street Bridge where we, uh, that was an innovative uh, process there. We uh, used uh, dehumidified uh, the main cable. We shoot dehumidified air through the cable, and I'll show you the picture a little later here. And uh, there is a savings, uh, 5 million in cable maintenance. So uh, you keep the water, usually it hangs it in the lower sections of the cable, but uh, we want to preserve the cables on this suspension bridge. It's a couple of group jobs. We also work with the inspection reports, put together a group project. These are a couple of projects. We got a moment slab we're putting in and we're taking care of some undermining. And uh, we typically uh, advertise a group job every year, probably uh, five to seven bridges. And that's uh, very beneficial to take care of these issues. Another group job that was the 18. This is the 19 uh, issues with head walls. So uh, and we extended uh, the structure on Pine Creek number nine. So uh, we have contracts, we have consultants that put groups together, then we can bid them out and get a good price when we uh, have a group of structures that need this work. Also state funding, we work with the district on state funding bridges and uh, we line up funding uh, for these bridges to get uh, the issues addressed. Here's a couple of the ones that we worked on and uh, always funding is uh, probably the need that everybody has and never enough funding. So uh, you got to plan which projects you want to do and how you address your issues is probably a lot due to the funding you have available. There's another bridge we did with state funding. So we use typically different funding for different projects. We try to address as many issues and our critical issues as soon as possible. So we try to get the funding in line with what uh, the issues are and this for state funding. We have to get reimbursement agreements. We work with the district on that, but uh, get a lot of projects done. So uh, we appreciate all their oversight. Also, this is the 10th Street Bridge again. You can see the cable, the wrap, and, uh, the wrap around it. Uh, and you can see they shoot uh, dehumidified air through that cable so it uh, doesn't deteriorate. Some work along the curb lines, but uh, this is more of a rehab job. So it's more expensive one. So the dehumidification should help push off that uh, rehab longer for the main cables. Also, also another uh, federally funded Rachel Carson Bridge, uh, another rehab. So uh, the more work we did the curb line, you can see a couple workers there. We actually uh, lifted the plate up there so the water wouldn't sit and deteriorate. We wanted to run off. Uh, you can see them pouring the deck there on the left. So uh, great jobs. We have a great partner with the district. So uh, any locals, uh, if you need any help, the districts are very helpful. So we appreciate all their help. and. Uh, that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Keith. Absolutely. We'll open it up to questions unless there's more slides. All right. Nope, we're good to go to questions, Crystal Ann. All right. Well, while we wait a little bit to see if any questions come in, 
I know I, I want to know how much coordination is needed between PennDOT and the county. How much are you guys, you know, working together uh, on these inspections and, and maintenance? Well, the case said uh, they manage our uh, NBIS inspection contracts. So uh, a lot of coordination there. They look them over, then we get them and look them over to see what we can do and what issues we can address. Uh, so that is great to have that coordination and a great partner to work with. We also got to look at what funding we can use to address these issues, whether it's state, local, or actually Allegheny County funding. Uh, we want to keep ahead of the curve and address the issues in a timely manner. Thank you. Now, how do you work together to prioritize with all the, the findings that you're seeing? Well, I guess if you're talking bridges, uh, County, we use uh, sufficiency ratings. We use an inspection reports to see what the ratings are for the deck and superstructure, uh, substructure, and uh, any posted structures. So we use all that and find out which critical structures we need to address. Also, uh, ADT is another issue uh, we look at on a higher volume roads. Uh, we need to address those issues in a timely manner. Thank you. Last question here. Are there any other agencies that get involved in planning funding for these projects? Uh, yes, we use the Southwestern Planning Commission, the SBC, and uh, we work with the district, PennDOT District 11 also. So uh, any other municipalities or that need help, uh, that's a great source to go and see what funding you can get to help uh, address any issues you may have. Thank you so much. Appreciate both of your time. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, my thanks to you, Steve, as well as to you, Keith. We appreciate um, you presenting as part of today's session. Again, folks, if you have any questions for Steve or for Keith, uh, please use the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Um, at this point, we will move on to our next speaker for today. Um, our next speaker is Alberto Medina who is the research project manager in the new products and innovation section within PennDOT's Bureau of Project Delivery. And we'd like to welcome Alberto to today's session. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK. Uh, so I want to talk about a polyester polymer concrete. Uh, this being used in as a bridge deck overlay. A little bit of a history of a PPC. Uh, this is not a, a new material. Uh, California have been using polyester polymer concrete since the 80s, and they have used uh, PPC in climates that are uh, mountain climate uh, with a lot of free saw cycles, and those decks have been performing very well through until today. Uh, the Pendot experience on, on polyester polymer concrete is it's more recent. Um, we have a couple of projects in the mid 2000, and after that, uh, there were no more projects until 2013, where we where we got a, a request from uh, Walsh. They uh, they wanted to use a PPC for bridge deck overlays in 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 many hundreds of Bridge, bridge replacements that they were working on. So we, we look at the performance history and uh, there, there was plenty of history for the material. Uh, we call New Year's in New York and, and they actually were actively using PPC at the time. Uh, so in 2018, we developed a, a special provision and by 2020, 
the 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 special provision was revised and now it's in PAP 408 section 1047. Uh, talking about uh, what districts have used PPC, uh, District 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 11, they have at least one PPC project. This is on the PENDOT uh, project. So a little bit about the benefits of polyester polymer concrete. Uh, PPC, uh, it has a very high compressive strength and flexural strength, and it can develop the strength very rapidly. So in two to three hours, you can open to traffic and overlay. Um, it also has a very low permeability, so it protects the deck and the stru uh, uh, structure under. A little bit of the negatives or disadvantages of using PPC. Uh, the, there is prep work like you will do in, in an epoxy overlay, um, and you need to have a moisture free deck. So there are years that are challenging to find. Uh, you know, windows of opportunity to place uh, the material because of uh, the moisture mainly. Also, the the range, temperature range where you can use a PPC, is 40 to 90 Fahrenheit. So during the summer, you may be, you may have to do a night placements because you don't want to place it uh, a temperature above 90 degrees. Another uh, disadvantage is that the, there are not many contractors in Pennsylvania that have the expertise or the equipment to place PPC. So uh, if you read a, project, a small project, you, you may have uh, difficult funding, finding a contractor. And I think that the, the, the biggest disadvantage is the cost. So we, uh, I calculate the cost about an average, uh, I mean, medium size project, and we were talking about $4,000 uh, a square yard of a cubic yard of, con of PPC. That's the equivalent of $120 and more per square yard at one inch. So, $120 versus an epoxy overlay, it's around $40. We are talking about three times the cost. But again, this treatment lasts longer. And uh, it's actually thicker, lasts last longer, and you can correct even a little bit of uh, the, the, the smoothness of a uh, or, or if you have some little bit of rats in the deck. Um, so PPC is sold as a system. This meaning that all the components of the polyester polymer concrete are provided by a single manufacturer. Um, the primer, which is in this case, is a high molecular weight methacrylate, the liquid parts, and the aggregates fine and coarse. So all of it, it has to be provided by the manufacturer. This is to ensure that the, the compatibility, compatibility of the uh, different parts are, uh, are okay. I mean, we, we will not like to have a Make, have something uh, placing something that it, it's it was it's not proven to be compatible. So uh, a little bit about the liquid parts. The the primer, 
The purpose of a primer mainly is to fill the cracks and promote the addition of the treatment. The, then the, the PPC itself, it, it's about 98% uh, polyester polymer pressing. And then we have 1.5% 1, 1 of uh, organic peroxide or DDM9 and secure. So the, the last two, the DDM9 and the secure, uh, depending on the temperature, you uh, they, they are tweaked, they, they vary a little bit. There are tables, the, the manufacturer supply tables, so depending on the placement temperature, you you will have the you will tweak the DDM9 and the accelerator. And the aggregates, um, so we have two parts of a fine aggregate and one part of a stone. Uh, this is not any aggregate. It's a very low absorption, high quality aggregate. This translates in high durability. And it also is very uh, hard. So we are talking about the most hardness of seven. Um, which provides a very good friction. And uh, as some of you may know, uh, there are very few aggregates that can meet the most hardness of seven. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the placement. Uh, there are two ways of mixing polyester polymer concrete mainly. One is a mortar mixer, uh, not much different than any mortar mixer. It's just that you have to clean it. it, 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 it polyester polymer concrete sticks to tools and everything, so it's just, but you will use the same type of uh, mortar mixer. And then in the picture, we have a volumetric mixer track. So this track was, it's specifically developed for a mixing polyester polymer concrete. And we have a, a large tank that stores the, the resin, the polyester polymer resin. And then we have two smaller tanks that they hold the DDM9 and the Secure. Um, also in the track, there are two bins that hold the aggregate. So the aggregates are separate, fine and, um, and coarse. They are separate, and the conveyor belt uh, brings the aggregate to, to the back of the track. Uh, at that point, uh, all the components are supplied and they are mixed in an auger. Uh, so, it's a continuous operation until you run out of a, either aggregate or binder or one component. So a pretty, pretty good, uh, pretty high production rate for this type of truck. Oh, the placement. Um, so if you have a, a smaller job, or a thinner lift, like an inch, up to two inches, I would say, uh, you can use a vibratory screed. Um, you know, you, you can place steel prof uh, tubes and insides just to get the, 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 height, the, the height that you, you're looking for. And not much different than you would be placing a, a cementitious material. But for high production rate, or if you go very thick, I'm talking two inches plus, three up to, you can do six, eight inches thick, even more. You you are looking at using a, a, a slip form paper. So this is manufactured specifically for polyester polymer concrete. 
and you have a what well, the whole machine is mounted on on tracks uh, that has a there is a conveyor belt in the middle of the machine uh, moving forward. The mixed volumetric tracks dumped uh, polyester polymer concrete already mix in this conveyor belt. Uh, the polyester polymer concrete falls in a spread box and is distributed by an auger and vibrated by several vibrators. So very high production. Um, we uh, I, I took these pictures on a large project in District uh, 6. So what we have learned from PPC, um, it's a, an excellent alternative for short lane closures. So you, you can bring up traffic uh, pretty quickly. Don't have to wait uh, for material to cure. I mean, um, if you have a Schmidt camera, I have seen uh, overly that you can, they open at one and a half hour after being placed. So develops the strength very quickly. Uh, it is it is recommended a, a thickness of one inch minimum. We saw some. I, I, I'm not sure if it was New Jersey or New York that they were doing three fourths of an inch, but they had many issues. It, it was just too thin for. Uh, they were. Uh, the writability, I mean, it wasn't, the final product wasn't smooth. And it, it was just not worth the savings. Uh, another lesson learned was uh, that it's better to use a PPC after cracks are developed in the deck. So let's say you put a deck one year, you like to have that deck hopefully open to traffic and, and ideally after one winter. So all the cracks in the deck are developed and you can seal them with the with the primer material, the mesacrylate. Uh, you also want to group the projects, otherwise you're going to, I mean, the price can double uh, if you do small projects, so you you would like to group several small decks, and also that's going to help you to get a, a a contractor with more experience. Uh, the weather, the climate, also plays a factor in the production. So again, if we have a wind, uh, a summer with a lot of rain. Uh, it's a it's a challenge to to use the material. Then temperature changes are are an issue. So you will not like to place material if you are expecting big temperature changes. As you're going to you may you are likely to get uh, cracks due to stress, stress cracks or whatnot. Uh, so challenges, so again, we have very few contractors, but they, we have been getting more contractors as we use the material, so I don't see it as a long-term challenge. Um, then we have another challenge is uh, there are new technologies being developed. We are getting applications for, uh, similar systems that claim to be alternate to polyester polymer concrete, either hybrid systems or epoxy PPC materials. And the final challenge is that it's very difficult to evaluate those materials because very, it's very difficult to uh, simulate or uh, how the material is going to behave in the field after the uh, freeze thaw cycles and whatnot. 
Um, oh. And yeah, that, that's that's what they have in. Uh, if anybody has a question. Yes, we have at least one question that has come in so far, and please, uh, others, if you have any questions, please post them. So the question is, is this application comparable to the weight of what it replaced, or will it make a noticeable difference? Um, so in the P3 uh, experience, so if you're planning on using PPC for, for a brand new structure, you can uh, build the deck with a, a recess of one inch uh, and then just fill that up with one inch of a uh, PPC. In that case, uh, uh, the, the weight, I mean, it, it will not change the weight of the concrete and PPC are very similar. Uh, if you are to overlay an existing structure, um, any one inch is not a, a significant weight i mean we oftentimes use several inches of bituminous on on bridge decks and that's far more uh, it's far heavier than than using an inch of ppc so i, I would say it's it's it, it's the weight is actually uh, in most of cases it's it's it it will be less because you can use uh, less inches of material in, uh, to obtain a similar performance. Thank you. Yeah. Another question, what is the design life of the PPC deck overlay? Yeah, so in DM4, we call it for a minimum of 25 years, um, but uh, that's very conservative. Uh, I think uh, we should be looking at 30, 35 years minimum of life for an overlay. Um, again, in California, they have bridges, other, they, they don't have a lot of traffic, but they have been going through a free soil cycles for, um, you know, 40, 50 years. Uh, yeah, 40 years, yeah. And they are in excellent condition. So I would say 30 years. Thank you. Plus. Another question. Are districts using this on newly constructed bridges as P3 did or existing decks as preservation? So I'm not aware of any district using it in new bridges. Uh, the largest project we had was had been in District 6 where they actually did a micro a hydro demolition of uh, you know several inches of concrete and they're placing several inches back of PPC on top of the existing concrete. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not aware of any project in, in a brand new deck. Another question about the, the weight. Is it 135 pounds per cubic foot versus 150 pounds per cubic foot of normal concrete? Can you clarify? Uh, well, I don't have the numbers, but I would say it's closer to 150 pounds uh, per per cubic foot. I mean, it, it's resin is, is as heavy. Uh, it, I mean, the, it's not any lighter than concrete. It, same weight or very close to to it. 150. I, that that would be closer to to it. Thank you. Another question. Yeah. If you scarify an existing concrete bridge deck with cracks to a depth of one inch and place the PPC to one inch, would this be a good application of the product? Yes, that would be an excellent uh, use of a material. Um, you can hydro, you can scarify, and, and whatever you, you take out, you can put back. Um, and you can extend the life of, you know, those decks for quite a bit. Yes. Okay. Last question: How does it hold up when salt starts to get in any cracks that may occur? So, uh, polyester polymer concrete, uh, 
I'm not aware of any chloride ion penetration within the, poly, uh, the polyester polymer concrete. Uh, so the, the worst thing it could happen is that the uh, chloride ion goes through it uh, to, you know, what you're trying to protect the concrete under. Uh, but it, it, the, it uh, um, I think it's uh, it's just a, a uh, I don't know how to how to explain. You 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 we're using it as a protective treatment. So let's instead of a epoxy overlay, and it 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 performs better than. An epoxy overlay uh, cracks do not develop as much, and it's also it is also very easy to repair. So if you have a an area with cracks, you you can just repair that area without having to remove the entire uh, the uh, treatment, which is not the case for uh, or it would be way more difficult for an epoxy overlay. So, yeah, it, it it does not contam it get con it doesn't get contamination from chloride ion, and it protects better the the concrete under. Thank you. That's all the time we have uh, for questions, and we can uh, we thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. Again, if there are more questions that come in for Alberto, um, we will uh, go to them after our last presentation. So that brings us to our last presenter for today, uh, who is Kristen Langer. She is the Assistant Chief Bridge Engineer uh, within PennDOT's Bureau of Project Delivery, and I'd like to welcome Chris to today's session. Thanks, Daniel. All right. Um Previously, we've presented information on GRS IBS, geosynthetic reinforced soil integrated bridge, integrated bridge systems. What I'm bringing forward now is updates from new research we have and lessons learned from the incident. If you have questions on the concept of the GRS IBS, if you haven't heard about it before, I can give you more information on the background of that later on. All right. Currently, DRS IBS is available for use by municipalities because it's in our pub 448, 447, and it is part of PennDOT's bridge design standards. However, with trying this new technology in the last uh, seven years or so, we, I think we built our first GRS bridge back in 2013, we put some tight restrictions on it. Currently, the maximum ADT you can have on a GRS bridge is 400 vehicles per day. Maximum stream velocity is 12 feet per second. Span length less than 70 feet. Abutment height less than 30 feet. And it's not available on overpass structures. This is where we are right now. We, the problem is, is we've done just about all the GRS bridges we can at this threshold. And they've been performing well through storms, um, other damage that could have happened to them. We're comfortable with the construction process. We think that it's been readily accepted and we're ready to step to the next level. So, through stick incentive funds from FHWA, we were able to perform some more research. And we did a one-year contract research project with Penn State University. Looking at, we wanted to see how our requirements compared with other states and their currently published data, new research that's come out from FHWA on this technology, and look at how our specifications compare, and do we want to do any improvements or upgrades. That research was completed in March of 2020. PennDOT has given us the new recommendations, and we've evaluated them. We're getting ready to present those to Tom Maciosi, our chief bridge engineer, for review and approval. What Penn State's re recommended to us based on their research 
and it was a whole big research report on this, if anybody is interested, is that the ADT doesn't need a limit. Stream velocities don't need a limit either. Span lengths have been taken up to about 140 feet. Our abutment length was just about right, therefore the thumbs up there, and to allow it on overpass structures. There are some states that do use this exclusively on overpasses. We're not quite to that point where we're ready to jump fully into that level. We're comfortable with it, but Randy Albert and I, who are the subject matter experts for this, looked over this. We've, and like I say here, we've tested the water and it's okay to swim in, but we're not ready to dive in head first. We're not ready to go all the way into this. As I said, we've, they've performed well to date, but resiliency is a big concern still for us. These bridges have only been in, ser in service here in Pennsylvania for, like I said, about seven years. And the first bridges, I think, are maybe 15, 20 years old. So we haven't, and they've performed well to this point, but we haven't gotten to that point where we're completely comfortable with the resiliency of these structures. So Randy and I took the, the numbers recommended by Penn State, and we came to a middle ground. And this is what we're getting ready to present to the chief bridge engineer for his review. ADT, we're not ready to go completely unlimited. We don't want these on the interstates at this point. So we're looking at going to a middle ground to 1,000 vehicles per day. That's kind of gets some of our middle level bridges where this might be viable. Taking the stream velocities up to 15 feet per second. Following the same criteria we have right now for conventional concrete blocks, but at that 10 to 12 feet per second threshold, we had set for requirements of a, what used to be the wet cast concrete two foot by two foot by six foot jumbo blocks. Those make the GRS not easily constructed, which is part of its inherent nature. And what we wanted to kind of adhere to the spirit of what GRS is. So what we've looked at is instead of doing those big wet cast blocks, is from 12 to 15 feet per second, we want to recommend utilizing some of the proprietary blocks that are out there for landscaping walls in that, and in that they interlock with each other, but that they have a minimum mass of 150 pounds per cubic foot. That puts them in line with the size and mass of an R6 riprap, which is what we're using on these GRS bridges. And what corresponds to the 12 foot, feet per second, 15 feet per second velocity range. Span lengths, we kind of shot for the middle of the road and went for 100 feet maximum. Abutment heights, we're still good with the 30 feet. We don't want to go above that. Design starts getting a little crazy there. And we're still not quite comfortable enough to try this on an overpass structure. So we're going to leave the overpass structure off the table at this point. This is where we want to be, and this is the goal that we've set for ourselves. As we've had GRS bridges, we've now started having them come into play and had an instance where recently we've had some damage done to a GRS bridge. This project was in District 2, and this is the other part of my presentation, is about learning a learning opportunity. And we just presented this at APC last week to the contractors within the state to give them an idea of what they're looking for and potential problems that could come about. Names will be held to protect the innocent. We're not going to talk about it, nor will I tell who, who, whose township this was in or what happened, but this project was in District 2 up in the north central part of the state. The bridge was built by local municipal forces in 2016. The water authority came through and needed to put in a, a new water line just this year in the summer, July, August area. During the pre-construction meeting, the contractor said there was no mention made of a geotextile extending back underneath the approach roadway. And as you saw in the picture, Utilities and GRS bridges don't play well together unless you plan for them ahead of time. This is what happened when they started excavating for the utility line. 
They hit the geotextile. They didn't know what was going on there, and they continued digging and ripped through multiple layers, you can see here, of geotextile. Typically, when you have a GRS IBS bridge, your utility should either run around it, above it, or during your design, you want to account for it and put in conduits, which kind of goes to how do we keep this from happening in the future? Communication, 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 communication during design, communication during the initial construction, and communication in the future so that people know what's out there. If you know in design that there's utilities in the area, we want to make sure that we tell people and allow for them in the future. There's a utility, you know, utility authorities, water authorities need to talk with the township supervisors or, or the district who's building this bridge and let them know ahead of time of work planned in the future. That way conduits can be designed into the structure and be allowed for with the geotextile material so that we don't have incidents like this in the future. During construction and in pre-construction meetings, if there's future work going on, we need to figure out a way to let contractors know that there is a GRS bridge in the area and it's not like a conventional bridge. So what we've come up with is a new warning system for contractors. On new construction, we are going to put, we are going to call for the underground utility detection tape. But what we found is, is we can get underground utility detection tape that's customizable that we can put down on the, on it, giving a warning saying stop digging, DRS abutment, call, and then where it says owner here, it would be the name of the township, the PennDOT district, or someone so that the contractors know this bridge isn't a conventional bridge. I can't just excavate behind the abutments because the abutment reinforcement is a lot further back than just the face that we see on the outside. Uh, we've also talked with, as I said, APC, the, the suggestion came up with and we're working through right now for the GRS bridges that are already out and in service where we can't put this new detection tape in is to working with PA1 call and having those bridges logged in to PA1 call so that when the contractor calls and says, hey, I'm doing a project in this area, it comes up that there is a GRS bridge in the vicinity and it gives a callback number to the bridge owner. But this new utility detection tape, that is going to go into our new BD standards or into our BD standards and is going to be put out here in the very near future on an e-notification to tell where to put this new utility detection tape. It can be picked up by a contractor's metal detector, which they typically do on a pre-construction scoping. They'll take a, a metal detector out there and there, a lot of utilities are calling for this utility detection tape. It has a thin metal strip through it that gets picked up and then they know there's something underground utility there that they have to be careful of when they excavate. We've also talked with FHWA and told them about what happened. They're looking into it, they're very interested, and they're looking at developing repair procedures for when something like this happens to hopefully be able to come up with a way to safely repair this. The repair that was done by the contractor, they filled it with a flowable backfill or a flowable concrete type of mixture, which worked and it, and it got the job going, it kept the job going. It completed the repair. However, this bridge no longer performs like a GRS bridge because we don't have the continuity of the geotextile running from the abutment into the approach roadway to do the no bump at the bridge, which is the, one of the big uh, impetus for GRS bridges is you eliminate the bump at the bridge. So this bridge now um, for our tracing of how this is performing, we can't use this in our modeling anymore because it's not uh, a homogeneous, uh, it's not a fluid connection. Uh, we are always there to assist the districts, should something like this, or the municipalities, the districts, whoever, 
should something like this happen, if you call myself or Randy Albert, who are the subject matter experts for this, we can come out and help you right away to come up with a repair that will keep the integrity of the GRS bridge in place. There. How did I jump so far? Okay. In conclusion, the research, we found that it works, but how do we make it better or use it more? That's where our research for, with PSU came in. We're looking to move our, our standards higher or our thresholds higher so that we can use it in more places. And hopefully we'll have that come out about the same time as the e-notification, maybe slightly after. I'm hoping for the e-notification for the tape to be out within the month. So that's my plan at this point. We're, we're doing final detailing and stuff like that. So I hope to have that out shortly. We hope to present to Tom our recommendations for increasing the thresholds, and we'll have those out either at the same time or slightly later. Constant and never-ending improvement. As my mom told me when I was growing up, it's not a failure if you learn from it. We've had, we've learned, we've found where we have an issue. Now we're learning from it. We're coming up with ways to notify people in the future that a GRS is br the bridge is there, and for the ones that are already in place how we can keep them on the radar so that should construction happen in or around them, we don't damage what's already there or we work around it. The other big thing is if something happens, call for assistance. Subject matter or experts are always available to assist municipalities or districts. As I said, here, you know, here's my contact information. And the other subject matter expert, Randy Albert, is up in District 2. He's the one that brought GRS to the forefront with PennDOT, worked with, you, with the municipalities to try it in one location, and then eventually got it put into the local roads uh, publication so that that can be used in the future. Thank you, Chris. We have a couple questions. OK. The first one, can you explain about how the, the damaged GRS IBS was repaired and was that uh, that it was it impacted by utility digging and then how was that repaired uh, how it was repaired is what happened is they dug through they hit the geotextile and apparently they didn't know that the system was there so they kept just kept digging and ripping out more of the geotextile what they ended up doing is that as I said they put flowable backfill around the, the utility the water line and then brought that up and I can't remember, I think it was two feet above the top of the uh, pipe. And then they try, they did some of the GRS methodology after that. They put down the compacted backfill and the geotextile layers after that. And they tried to steam in to some extent the new geotextile to the ripped geotextile. They did some of an overlap there, but it's not going to perform exactly in the same way. But it was, you know, it was good for what they had in the in the in the project site at the time. How, they fixed it as best as they could. So I have I have no negative fault to them for what they did. It's just it's not going to perform the same way. Thank you, Chris. Another question: Would this be a good alter alternate for replacing failing gabion baskets with the GRS and placing ready rock? blocks in front using this system as wing walls. The height would only be approximately six feet. It might be. I'd have to I'd have to see the layout. I mean, if you have a gabion basket retaining wall, yeah, I could, I could see this very easily being an option in that place. The only concern I would have is making sure that everything ties together uh, to your abutment. In that, in that respect, I might have a concern if you're trying to keep the existing concrete abutments and using a gabion basket or and using a GRS wall, it could work, but it would need to be looked at very closely. And you know, with any type of structural system, you still need to have an engineer do the design work for you. And there is FHWA guidance out there so on how to design these. But yes, the, the ready rock uh, retaining walls, I would think yes. And like I said, depending upon the specific site conditions, I would say that it's probably a viable option that might be explored. 
Thank you. Last question. Could you give some clarity on why we're still not allowing um, these on overpass structures? I think it's just a comfort level yet at this point. We're just not quite to that to that level to where we want to um, deal with the potential of impacting these abutments with a vehicle and not knowing how, how what kind of damage that would cause immediately. Uh, some of the other concerns are is it's is we're just not quite to a level of comfort yet. We don't have the resiliency issue is another factor that comes into play with it. Um, salt sprays and that going typically between overpass structures and how that could affect the performance of the DRS bridge. We're just we're just not to that comfort level yet. We like it. We like it for for our stream crossing structures because they have performed well in flooding situations. We've had some of our DRS bridges here in Pennsylvania being between 12 and 15 feet per second easily during some high water events up in District 2 where it's been videotaped and we've been able to estimate stream velocity. So we've seen that they're performing well. We just need to get an additional little level of comfort with them. But I hope, I hope and I think that we'll be able to advance to that point at some at some time in the future. Thank you. One more question did come in. Uh, how much post construction shifting have you noticed? Minimal on on bridges that haven't been uh, damaged like this one. We haven't checked this one yet to see if there's any shifting going on. I'm sure we will be keeping track of this one very closely. But the first GRS bridge that we put in back in 2013, I think uh, it's in the couple sixteenths of an inch total movement, and that's seven years old. I know it's been very nominal, and I know Randy Albert goes out usually about once a year to survey it and check and see, and there's been no movement and there's no bump at the bridge yet. Thank you, Chris. Looks like we have some time to circle back around to answer some questions that did come in late, but uh, thank you, Chris, for, for your time. All right, so a question came in earlier. If we could circle back uh, to Mark, a question came in about the link slab, and it's related to what type of grout was used as the base layer in the link slab? So Mark, are you able to unmute and try and answer? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think it was just a mortar based grout, a cementious type of grout. I don't think we use like an epoxy or anything like that. It was just something to provide a, a smooth base for the gasket material to be on. Thank you. I also have two questions that came in for Keith and Steve related to the uh, local bridge inspections. So if you guys are able to unmute, I'll, I'll start with the first one here. Crystal Ann, this is Danielle. Um, Steve had to leave us due to a okay. prior commitment, but Keith is still with us. Um, if for some reason Keith is unable to answer the question, we can circle back with Steve. Wonderful. All right, Keith. How often is the rating information updated and how is the how is the historical information maintained related to the local um, data? OK, so um, we keep them just like we keep our our state bridges and BMS um, load rating information is updated. Um, normally we want to keep that, you know, as fresh as we can, um, but Normally, it's under the recommendation of the uh, the inspection team out there. You know, if they're finding uh, additional section loss, uh, things like that, um, they'll make a recommendation to us. Um, or in the case of the locals, you know, the the inspecting consultant will make a recommendation to us and ask if we feel that it's necessary. Um, you know, at the time, and that they'll perform that that updated load rating uh, analysis, and then uh, you know we'll run over it and. Uh, hand it over to the, to the local officials um, at that point in time. So um, yeah, we keep all the data in BMS just like we do for our bridges. Um, and that's kind of the process for updating load ratings too. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kind of similarly, this second question uh, kind of ties that. What system do you use to track main maintenance needs that come out of the inspections? Sure, it's it's BMS as well. Um, you know, there's a specific section in BMS that, that we keep those priority maintenance uh, items in. Um, they're also in the reports as well uh, that get handed over to the uh, the locals. And um, I would assume that, that a lot of locals kind of keep track of them themselves too, but um, we keep it on our end, obviously. So we make sure that, uh, you know, zeros and ones are in compliance uh, and, and, you know, taken care of, mitigated uh, within the timeframes that uh, are allotted to them too. So, um, yeah, we treat them just like we do our bridges. Um, you know, that's why those contracts are, are so good for uh, for the locals. Thank you, Keith. And uh, Chris, one one last question did come in uh, for you as well here. So if uh, if you can unmute, we do have a question here about uh, you mentioned that this is a relatively recent innovation in Pennsylvania. How long has GRS IVS construction technique been used in other states? Can you expand on that? Well, the GRS technology itself dates back to the Han Dynasty and part of the Great Wall of China. There's portions where they've shown uh, the Great Wall was built with using layers of papyrus and plant material with compacted fill material. So the technology itself is very old. We're using it with new materials and I want to say it started, well, I know it started in Defiance County, Ohio, and I want to say it's about 20 years old in Ohio where the first ones were built. So the technology has been out there. We're using it with modern materials, you know, high strength geotextiles, uh, compact, compacted backfill materials where we're using plate tampers to compact the material tightly. So it's old, it's old technology that's getting a new a new life to it with new materials. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate the history lesson too. Those are all the questions that have come through. So thank you everyone uh, for presenting and those who provided thank questions. And Crystal Ann, um, I'm going to go back to the PPC presentation. Um, I'll know, I know Alberto had to leave us, um, but there was a question asked earlier about use of PPC on new decks. Um, Mark Nicholson, who's on the call with us, said that they are using PPC on new decks in just one, um, as well as Chris Langer said, she believes they are being used on some new decks in other districts as well. So I do want to open it up to Mark and Chris since they are, are both still with us. I know Mark um, mentions that they are seeing much better performance out of the PPC than with epoxy. So I do want to open it to Mark and Chris if they want to share any information about that as well. Uh, one of my staff, Tyler Colhane, is our uh, subject matter expert on decks and deck overlays and that. And when Alberto, Alberto said that, I shot a quick uh, text message to Tyler. Yes, he was saying um, there's multiple districts have, that have been using it on new construction. He mentioned, uh, and Keith might be able to confirm or deny this, District 11, District 10, District 8, District 6. Uh, he believes District 2 might have used it as well as District 12. So I know those districts as well and Mark in District 1. And to my knowledge, they've been performing quite well. And we did use it through the P3 program and there are a lot of PPC decks already out there. So I can, I know we've, we've seen good performance so far with the P3 bridges, so. Yeah, I was going to mention that, Chris. We I know a lot of the P3s in our in District 11, um, you know, use them on, on their brand new decks too. Um, I'm not sure how many new decks we've done under our own projects yet, but I think we're kind of talking about that right now, uh, experimenting as an option to uh, use that as opposed to an epoxy like Mark was talking about. Yeah, we in District 1, we've done um, I can't give you a number off the top of my head, but we've done um, at least several, if not closer to a dozen uh, new bridge decks, whether they were deck replacement or brand new bridges where we've put PPC on them. And the general consensus that we're getting back from um, 
our construction folks is that it seems like it's uh, a pretty good product. Um, they've been pretty happy with what they've seen in the field and the decks that we've put it on. Uh, we haven't seen any signs of failure. Uh, we haven't had any spalling or cracks or anything that's shown up prematurely. Um, the only disadvantages, if you want to call them that, that we've talked about internally within the district is it is a little pricey as compared to some of the other waterproofing methods. But, um, you know, as it was discussed in that presentation earlier, uh, the more we use it, we'll probably see more competitive pricing, you know, come through that. The only other um, issue we ran into on a couple of projects was on some of our longer bridges, um, we had some ride quality issues where the, uh, the contractor actually had to come back and do some grinding just to take off some some high spots and to you know improve the ride. But um, those may have been um, bridges that were um, the PPC was placed under um, traffic. We just closed the lane, so maybe that could be you know a problem there with just some of the vibrations and such, and, and the deck could have had been a contributing factor to some of the ride quality. All right, thank you so much, Mark and Chris and Keith for that additional insight relative to the PPC overlay. I'm just gonna do one last check with Chris Land to see if we got any more questions in. We did, we have one that came in and I think this might be kind of more general to the group. Have you heard anything on steel fibers and, co and concrete being used in the future? I don't know if anyone can speak on that, if they've heard anything. Well, I mean, steel fibers are part, are one of the main components of the UHPC, and we're starting to see a little bit more use of UHPC. So I'm not sure which direction they're talking about with using fibers, whether they're talking about using steel fibers in conventional concrete, in which case I haven't heard much about that, but through the UHPC, that's one of the primary or primary constituents of UHPC. So, yeah, I know in our district we we've, we've talked to some vendors about it. Um, this was probably a year or two ago, and it was um, like Chris was saying. Obviously, it's the main component in UHPC, but also they were kind of touting it as um, you know putting it in new bridge decks. Um, and it would kind of take the place of, you know, your latex overlay because it would kind of control the micro cracking um, in, in the top surface of your deck too. I, I don't think we ever got around to, to doing one like that, um, but um, obviously we have used it in UHPC applications for sure. Mark, I'm not sure if you guys did any of that in one or not. Say that again, Keith, I, you started to break up on me. Uh, sorry about that. I just I don't know if you you've used uh, you know steel fibers and you know brand new decks to kind of control the micro cracking in the top surface there um, on any of your decks. We haven't done that on a new deck. I don't think yet. No, not that I'm aware. I mean, other you know recently with the link slabs, we you know had the fibers and the UHPC for that, but I'm not aware of any other application. Okay, any final questions, Crystal Ann? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Well, I would like to take this opportunity oh, to thank. I lied. Oh, one oh, just one. showed up. Oh, <laughs> okay. I, was, I knew there was a, sometimes a delay in that. Um, Micropolymer fibers work for thin overlays versus Mac macro polymer fibers on thicker structural depths like depth. So I think that someone was just making a statement. So I'll read it again. Micro polymer fibers work for thin overlays versus macro polymer fibers on thicker structural concrete depths like decks. That was the last one. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Chris Ann. Um, thank you to all of our presenters today. We very much appreciate them taking the time to present on a lot of these great innovative things that are happening across PennDOT and um, at the local level as well. Um, we'd like to thank all of you for attending today's session. 
Um, as a reminder, the recording of today's session will be made available on the event website at www.pendot.gov forward slash innovations week. It'll be up there probably within a week or so. Uh, the other way you can listen to a playback of this recording and all of the questions and answers uh, is by clicking on the link that was in the calendar invitation that you were sent for today's session. When you click and join, um, you'll be able to listen to the recording. And one last plug for our virtual exhibit hall. Again, we have over 50 innovations um, on display from uh, local governments, uh, PennDOT, FHWA. Um, certainly encourage you to go out to our event website and check out the virtual exhibit hall. There is a contact form for you to submit questions about any of the innovations that you see. So again, thank you all so much for joining us and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day.